Okay, it is seven o'clock. I'm going to call this meeting of the whole to order February 16th, 2021 at 6 p.m. I will ask for a motion for approval of the February 2nd, 2021 Committee of the Whole meeting minutes. So moved. Who was that? Mayor Jane? Yes, sir. Okay. Second? Hunt? Okay. All right. Mayor? It, yes, ma'am. Can I go ahead and call roll? It's not on the agenda, but can I go ahead and do that to start Absolutely. off? Absolutely. Go ahead. Thank yes, ma'am. All righty. Alderman Ward? Here. Alderman Mims? Alderman Bill Van Besker? Here. Alderman Mary Jane Van Busker? Here. Alderman Emerson? Alderman Myers? Here. Alderman Green? Here. Alderman Azure? Absent. He's excused. Alderman, Alderman Hunt? Here. Alderman Walters? Here. Okay, we have a quorum. So we have a motion by Mary Jane and a second by Mr. Hunt for the approval of the February 2nd, 2021 Committee of the Whole Meetings. Any discussion? Any discussion? Hearing none, please call the roll. Mayor, I'm sorry, I wasn't listening. First and second. First, and, the, first was Mary Jane Van Buskirk. Second was Mr. Hunt. Thank you. And no Alderman, discussion, so call the roll. Alderman Mary Jane Van Buskirk? Yes. Alderman Hunt? Yes. Alderman Mims? Yes. There she is. Alderman Ward? Yes. Yes. Alderman Emerson? Alderman Green? Yes. Alderman Bill Van Beskert? Here. Alderman Walters? Yes. Alderman Azer? Excused. Alderman Myers? Yes. Okay, I will. <laughs> All right, motion passes. Can you hear me? Yeah, we can hear you. And, um, <laughs> we can hear you and your okay. other phone too. All right. <laughs> okay, motion passes. All right, next we're moving on to planning commission overview. Point of contact, Jennifer Baird, city attorney and Chris Gilbert, planning and zoning coordinator. What do you all have for us? Baird, Thank you, you Mayor. Over? Thank you, Mayor, so sorry. I'm gonna switch and share my screen here. Um, these are the same slides that were in your packet. Um, so just a little bit back in January, uh, the planning commission had asked staff to bring forth some information, really talking about what their role is, as well as what is the process for approving, uh, you know, various applications. So I'm going to really go over kind of a big 50,000 foot view of planning and zoning. And then, um, I think Chris is probably going to follow up with, with more details about what the city specific requirements and processes are. So with that, I'll get started. So to, to understand planning and zoning, I think it's kind of important to just think back of where did this come from? Because planning and zoning regulations really aren't as old as, as say, other uh, legal concepts. And really where planning and zoning got its start is from nuisance which is something that we still have today. But the basic theme of nuisance is, is that you're free to enjoy your property until your enjoyment interferes with someone else being able to enjoy their property. And so that was fine, but the problem with nuisances is, is you, first of all, had to wait for a nuisance to actually occur before anything could be done. And then secondly, you, you know, an individual had to bring a cause of action typically in court uh, to try and resolve the matter. And so back in kind of the industrial revolution started to take place, you had uh, people who were moving from, you know, making products by hand in their homes to all of a sudden now doing it on a mass scale and, you know, um, 
building factories and and so these factories were going next to homes causing you know various noises and and smells and so it was creating a real problem and so the federal government had to step in and so what they created was what they called enabling acts and so by the late 1920s every state has adopted able and these enabling acts so there's two of them one is the standard planning enabling act and the second one is the standard zoning enabling act so for missouri our enabling acts are located in chapter 89. So talk a little bit about planning first. And planning is that process of really just creating a vision of how you want your city to look. You know, where do you want residential? Where do you see industrial? Um, again, you're trying to look at it from, uh, you know, a bigger perspective uh, to see how the city wants to look. What's the vision? A lot of people, a lot of cities call that their comprehensive plan or master plan, uh, but that document could be one document, it could be several, meaning I know Lee Summit had master plans for not only streets, but also for infrastructure. And so they had a lot of different plans uh, for the city. Um, the, the important thing about these plans are, is they really are a guide for future developments. Um, they are not legally binding. But what they do serve is, is to help with regards to when applications come forward. Or for example, if you're rezoning some property, you can look to that master plan and say, okay, is this consistent with what we you know, want to see happen? So while we talk here about maybe things to consider when creating a plan, these are really some of the same things we should consider when you know, revising the plan as well. So, uh, the city of Raytown does have a, city, a comprehensive plan. You have a Highway 350 corridor plan, as well as a um, you have a, a central business district plan, which I would consider all those to be in the realm of a, of a master plan. Um, but one of the things that you should be looking at, and and certainly these plans should be revisited. Um, maybe it's every every five or ten years. Um, it's whatever you decide, but you know things do change, development changes, and so these are good things to then go back and take a look at. But what you want to do is go back and look at what were the goals that we were trying to establish. Is are those the same goals? Um, do some basic research. Where where do we see the population going? Um, where are people moving to and from? Uh, what's your current land uses? You know, and preparation of a plan. While there are entities out there uh, that you can pay to help you create the plan. Um, it's certainly not required, um, but those are some things you wanna look at as your land uses, where do you want community facilities, open areas. So lots of different things to consider. So when this plan is, is created, um, adopting of the plan, and this includes, again, this includes if you're going to change the plans, you wanna, it, is, it requires a public hearing, which is a 15 day published notice. Um, it has to be before the planning commission. Um, the planning commission, in order to approve it, it requires a vote uh, of the majority of the full planning commission to approve. And so once it's approved by the planning commission, it gets certified and it's sent to not only the board of aldermen, but the city clerk and the county recorder. Now I will tell you under statute that this is the planning commission's main purview is to create uh, this plan. And so um, while a lot of cities will have the governing body uh, review it and adopt it, that's not required by statute. So then we get into the membership of the planning commission. So under statute, it's seven to 15 members um, one of the members may be the mayor if the mayor chooses. Uh, one of the members may be an alderman if, if the alderman chooses it, and which the city of Raytown has. Uh, Alderwoman Emerson is your, is your person. Uh, the planning commission can also decide if those council or mayor, if those are just non-voting liaison members. Um, I will tell you at this point that there is a matter on the regular agenda. It's under the consent. It's a resolution to um, appoint um, Mr. Hunt as um, to the planning commission. And one of the reasons that staff's bringing forward that 
that resolution to you now, um, instead of maybe waiting is, is that we've had um, with, currently we have a nine member planning commission board, four members are now gone. And so that means all five remaining members must be at, at the meetings or else we can't have a meeting, which means applications cannot be heard. Since Alderman um, Hunt, um, his term is gonna end on the board of Alderman in a little over a month, uh, staff is just requesting that he be appointed um, to the planning commission. Again, while there may be a planning commission in March, those items won't be finally determined by the board of Alderman until probably late May or early, or excuse me, late April or early May when Alderman Hunt is no longer on the Board of Aldermen. So uh, staff thought that that was, that was reasonable. I thought that was reasonable. The other thing about the membership is, is that there is a four year term, staggered term. Um, the board yearly will uh, elect a chairman and a secretary to run the meetings and to take minutes. And the planning commission may be combined with the zoning commission, which is why you have a planning and zoning commission. Um, I will tell you just, it's very difficult to get people to serve. And if you had to create um, a zoning commission as well and try and get people for that zoning commission, it, it just becomes more and more difficult. So luckily the statutes do allow for that planning commission and zoning commission to, to be the same board. So now moving into zoning. So zoning is really determining how is the land gonna be used. And so things that you look at in the zoning regulations are what type of uses can take place on the property, what's the height, the density, what's the appearance of buildings, um, you know, setbacks. Those are the types of things that the, you know, that are on the zoning commission, if you will, to review. Um, all cities in Missouri that establish zoning and, and may establish zoning, but they have to have a zoning commission. So I've worked with a couple of small cities that don't have zoning. And so they get really mad when they hear there's not much you can do if a landfill wants to locate right next to a residential um, you know, house because there's no zoning to regulate the use of that property. Um, typically you see in zoning, it just divides the city into different areas and you can see that normally represented on a map. And the typical zones you'll see is, you know, single family, a commercial, industrial, agricultural. Those are all pretty standard. Um, some cities get more detailed and will have different types of uh, single family, um, maybe single family with big lots. Um, they may have multifamily and different types of multifamily. So, um, it's really how the city wants to kind of divide up the city and how, you know, how they want to do that. So again, zoning commission is the body that recommends zoning, not only the zoning code, what does the zoning should, what should the zoning say, but it also recommends amendments to that. Um, as I said before, you have to have a zoning commission if you're going to have zoning. Um, and again, you can combine this with your planning commission. So. Here's just a few statutes to refer to, to uh, with, which really addresses the commission. I won't go over those. So in a nutshell, oh, go ahead. I was gonna say, Jennifer, before you move forward, can you, um, one of the portions under the planning, after the 15 day uh, public hearing, uh, mm -hmm. 15 days um, to publish, and then once you get the majority of the full planning commission approved, yes. after approval, it says certified copies are sent to the council clerk and the county recorder. Uh, why is that uh, sent to the county recorder? Just for people to understand. Um, um, yeah, so I not... think... Go ahead. Oh, go ahead. I, so, was gonna say, I, I want people to understand that I, when it's sent to the county recorder, why that is. Certainly. So it just becomes, uh, it, it comes a part, a record of the property. So people who are coming in, who are wanting to maybe develop, this is one of the things that they will see is, okay, here's a plan, the city has adopted a plan, and I may want to make this property an industrial property, but you've got a master plan that says this really is supposed to be commercial. So that may help uh, with decisions on whether they should actually purchase the property or, or at least for, for people to ask questions 
and come to the city and say, here's what I want to do. Can we change this? So again, the plan can always be changed. So, and a good example of that was when um, Legoland was coming to the metro area. Uh, I think Lee Summit happened to be one of the cities that they were looking at and the city, there was a specific piece of property that was not, uh, one, it was not zoned, but also the, the, the plan for the city didn't call for this kind of recreational amusement area. And so the city went through the process to amend its plan to allow for that. I mean, obviously that, that's not where Legoland ended up, but just to show you that, you, you know, it's a plan, you can change it, but did that help answer the question, Damon? It did. Okay. Sorry, let me get forward here. So, so the role of the commission in planning and zoning decisions, just to kind of break it down, they are primarily a recommending body. Um, as you're aware, so any type of zoning request or application that comes through, they're gonna make a recommendation to the board. The board has the ultimate decision on those, on those requests. However, when it comes to adopting a comprehensive plan, that again, by statute is really in, is really in the planning commission's purview. Um, and so as long as the planning commission approves it, uh, there's really no, um, certainly the board could approve it, but they're really just approving it in as, as more of a, um, um, as just more of a blessing, if you will, versus an actual um, act of, of the government. Lastly, uh, review and approve all plans for new public infrastructure and facilities. So anytime that you're looking for to approve the location, extent, and character of some public facilities, there's a provision that says, Planning Commission, you make a recommendation. However, if your recommendation is to disprove that application, then it, gets, it goes to the governing body and the governing body can only overrule the Planning Commission's decision by a two thirds vote and that's of the entire governing body. So just wanted to talk real quick about the zoning process. I think um, Chris is gonna get into more details about this one as it applies to the city of Raytown specifically, but typically there's an application that gets filed. In this case, I'm using as an example, a zoning change. Somebody wants to rezone property. Um, the application needs to be filed by the property owner, or at least there needs to be an affidavit signed by the property owner, acknowledging that they are aware of this application because you don't want your neighbor to submit an application rezoning your property uh, you know, without your knowledge. The second thing is, is that notice uh, of a hearing is published and that's all that's required under the statute is the uh, Publish notice. Um, a lot of cities will also send notice to surrounding property owners. And that 185 feet, the significance of that 185 feet is the fact that if someone wants to file a protest, um, it could be filed by either um, the, the people affected by the rezoning or it could be filed within uh, those people. It's a 30% of the people within 185 feet can file a protest petition. If they file the protest petition, what that means is, is it requires the governing body to approve then that specific application by two thirds vote instead of majority. But again, on this notice, a lot of cities will require that not only that the notice be published, but also sent to surrounding property owners as well as being posted on the property itself. So then the planning and zoning, they hold the public hearing and they make their recommendation um, lastly, it goes to the Board of Aldermen, and I have hearing question mark on this one because under the statute, there is, it does not, it does not state that it has to be a public hearing before the Board of Aldermen. Um, most cities, though, do require that hearing, um, so I just wanted to, to let you note that distinction. Um, lastly, the Board of Aldermen will then make its decision. So then we get to subdivisions and plats. And so subdivisions really all about how are, is property divided. And so the city can establish various different requirements for subdivisions and plats. 
um, a lot of times those regulations will set forth what are the standards for the streets, uh, what's the grade, uh, what's you know the standard for installation of utilities and facilities. And so um, that's where it gets into a lot more details about more of the infrastructure of a project. Um, plat approval is normally cities will follow the state statute on, on the approval, but there is uh, something unique in that plat approvals have to be approved within 60 days um, of the application uh, of their providing the application or it's deemed approved. Um, now, a lot of times there are some provisions that state that the applicants and the city can agree to an extension. Um, and, but most of the time, these things do roll through pretty quickly. And I think primarily is just because subdivision and plat decisions really are an administra administrative decision, which means cities just, you check the box. If, if someone submits a, a final plat document to the city and they've complied with all the subdivision regulations, then there's not a lot of discretion for the city to deny that plat. So here's where I think the most important uh, information is for at least this body is that having to do with the zoning decisions and generally where do those zoning decisions fall? What category? Um, there's the legislative, which is really defined by the police power. Um, I have here, remember Euclid. Euclid was a case, it's called Village of Euclid versus Amber Realty Company. And in that case, uh, Euclid, uh, the village, had rezoned a bunch of property that was owned by uh, this Amber Realty Company. And because of the, the rezoning, there was some property that could not be used and as, um, as intensely as the, the Amber Realty Company really wanted. So they filed a suit against the village. And so this went up to the Supreme Court. And this is really the first time that the court said that zoning regulations um, are will generally be held up as long as there's some public purpose. So, so it's important to know that when you're making a de legislative decisions, courts are really gonna defer to what your decision is. Um, so examples of some legislative decisions that you normally do, or you know, if you're going to make changes to the zoning code, which we've done in the past, if you're going to rezone an area, um, those are some, some examples. The quasi-judicial decisions that are made are really quasi-judicial decisions or decisions um, where certain officials are given power, that power is outlined by statute, and um, they are appointed to perform the statutory function. So the, the example here is really the Board of Zoning Adjustment. Uh, the Board of Zoning Adjustment makes those decisions about how the zoning regulations, how they should apply to specific properties, if you will. And I'll talk a little bit more about zoning commissions here in just a second. As I stated before, when we're looking at platting decisions, those platting approvals are really ministerial. Um, we just apply, you know, whatever those subdivision regulations, if, if they've complied with those regulations, it's a check the box. And so there's little discretion to, to not approve them. Um, a good case out there, which really gets into the details of this is the Furlong Companies versus City of Kansas City had to do with a car wash. Um, I won't go into that, that case, but it really lays out and it very well um, about platting decisions. So lastly, just wanna to touch on, so in the standard planning and zoning enabling acts, there are provisions because the idea here is that if an ordinance goes too far, it's gonna be declared as a taking of property without just compensation. So for example, if you've got some regulations where you know certain setbacks are required and maybe there's a property because of the shape it is or because of the size, there's no way it can meet those setback requirements. And so the, the, the enabling acts um, created a Board of Zoning Commission and that Board of Zoning, or excuse me, uh, Board of Zoning Adjustment. And they're kind of the safety valve, if you will, uh, to then be able to review the, those applications and determine um, if there is a certain, if certain criteria are met, whether 
the city's zoning regulations should actually apply to certain pieces of property. So with that, um, I'm happy to answer any questions or if you wanted to let Chris go next and then ask questions. Nobody got any questions right now. Let's go ahead and let Chris go. Okay, can you, get, can you all hear me? Yes. Okay, uh, the Planning Commission Chairman and the Planning Commission in December asked that with their annual meeting that we bring forward a uh, example of where do these applications go? What happens to them before we see them as a hearing? And I thought that was a very compelling type of, of uh, project. So I put together a 10 point or 10 page PowerPoint uh, for that meeting, which was, was uh, I was directed to make it a little smaller. So what we did is we boiled it down into a, a flow chart, which you have in your packet. And I'm gonna go over that flow chart now with you here. Uh, let me find it, there it is. All right, and the example that I'm using for this is the most common type of application that you're going to see, in, uh, at least at the time being in Raytown, that is the conditional use permit. Yes, this can also include uh, plan development uh, plans, it can include rezones, uh, but this is the most common one that we see is the CUP. And essentially what, it, what happens is there's a pre-development meeting, uh, if necessary, that, that's an optional step depending on what they're actually asking for. It. If it's a major project type CUP, then we ask for that. If, if it's a very minor use CUP, then uh, in many cases we don't. But there'll be a pre-development meeting with city staff. We go over the requirements, give them the, the application materials. And then it proceeds to the next step, uh, which is totally on the applicant. And that is actually filing the application with the community development department. And by filing an application, it's, it's uh, intended to be a quote unquote complete application. Everything has to be there or we don't accept it. And then the next step in the process, the city staff reviews the application for completeness, schedules the matter on an upcoming planning commission docket. Uh, this can also include in this phase, uh, this can include review of plans uh, we're doing one right now for a CUP that has a site plan included and there's back and forth on that. So uh, when we when we believe that the site plan is in a condition that is presentable for hearing, then we, at that point, we get it scheduled for planning commission action instead of prior. Um, the next step from there, as you see on the flow chart, there's uh, two potential directions it can go, which is here and here. Uh, this one city staff gives applicant mailing addresses for property owners within 185 feet. And that's in our zoning ordinance, that requirement. And then there's the city staff sends public hearing notice to local paper for publication. That's a statutory requirement. So going down this path with the notices, uh, the applicant picks up the public hearing. Uh, well, I give them, the, okay. Um, they get the list of property owners and it's, and it's their uh, responsibility to mail that. And then at the same time, within a few days, they pick up the public hearing sign that post on the property. At the same time, they send out the neighborhood meeting letter to the owners within 185 feet. Uh, we ask them to take a picture of the posted sign on the property so that there's evidence that it was posted uh, at the correct time. And then the applicant holds the neighborhood meeting that was advertised up here and provide staff a copy of a sign-in sheet synopsis of the meeting. It's important to point out that staff is not involved in this neighborhood meeting. This is purely between the developer and or the applicant and the residents within 185 feet that were invited to the meeting. And then it, it comes together with the public hearing notice publication in this location, city staff prepares the staff report for the planning commission packet. And that includes everything gained through this entire process through here, which includes a lot of uh, meetings with the developer uh, or the applicant, as well as conversations with uh, uh, various neighbors that will call to get more information. So there's there by this point, there's expected to have been a lot of input from the neighborhood in a, 
particular project. Unfortunately, sometimes there isn't, uh, but in some cases uh, we do get a lot of input. For example, in the recent case you heard with the adult daycare uh, at 7800 Raytown Road. Um, then it proceeds to this step. City staff sends out planning commission packets to commissioners, applicant, uh, copy support of aldermen, post the agenda in city hall lobby and on the city website. And then it proceeds to planning commission public hearing. And uh, assuming that there's not a continuance or a request for more information that causes a delay, a recommendation is made that night and then that is forwarded to the board of aldermen public hearing and two readings of the ordinance, which is this step. And again, assuming that there's no delays in the process here or continuance requests, uh, there would be two consecutive board meetings where uh, there would be a public hearing on the first one, continue potentially into the second meeting, and then there'd be two readings at the same time. And then finally, if the CUP is approved by the Board of Aldermen, business must complete conditions and meet state conditions if applicable obtain occupancy permit and file for a business license. But also in this step is, while this is ongoing, is waiting for the signed copy of the ordinance to be provided for it to be official. And the mayor has a number of days after approval by the board within which to uh, consider each and every ordinance uh, to uh, approve or veto. Now notice this uh, asterisk down here, average application takes three and a half months for complete processing. All these steps that I went over here for a conditional use permit, if you if a person applies in the middle of a of an application period, which is approximately 30 days, takes three and a half months. Uh, so depending where they apply within there and depending on continuances, this could take potentially four or five months uh, when you account for those things which do happen from time to time. So uh, it's not a short process and we sometimes get applicants who have, are not aware of this process and they open up shop in Raytown and we have to remind them that they have to go through this process and get the permit before they can uh, proceed with their business. And that sometimes generates a lot of um, uh, concern on the part of the applicant. And that's the timeline there. Uh, anyone have any questions on the, the general process? And it's the same for rezones, very similar. And you, uh, uh, plan approvals. Chris, would you take, there you go. Anybody have any questions for Chris? Sure, Chris, can you kind of explain more on your timing uh, regarding days in between those? I know you uh, certain app, app, the applications are done within 185 feet. How much time does a person have to go to to move to the next step? Um, well, I'm going to take this off of the Planning Commission calendar. And for example, let, let's use uh, <coughs> let's use Logan Villas, which is under review right now, going to the Planning Commission in March. Um, Logan Villas just had their notices for the March meeting sent out on the 9th of February. That's for the, the neighbor notices. And the public hearing notice was published shortly thereafter. The, the uh, public hearing sign will be posted on the property uh, tomorrow. The applicant's uh, going to be here from Springfield to do that. And the neighborhood meeting he's hosting on the 18th of February, which is Thursday. And then he has over the weekend to put together a synopsis due by the 22nd. And then the uh, the packet is produced next week, or not next week, but on the 26th of February for the uh, 4th of March meeting. So there's so, no particular amount of time a person have to advertise uh, for the application, correct? Not for the neighbor notices, but there is a, a statutory requirement for the provision of the public hearing notice to be published 15 days prior to the hearing date. And that's how the state statute. And then uh, explain more. Um, typically, we when we have them, uh, I know our board is aware of that uh, there was a change. But uh, as far as your um, or ordinance of being read, typically it's two readings with the CUPs. Uh, when do they advertise the dates for that, for the initial reading? Maybe uh, you can answer that question. 
yeah, those uh, those dates are all included in the neighbor notice that goes out uh, that the applicant sends on, in this case, the he gets the list on 9th of March, they're mailed out by the 11th of March. Included in that is not only the invitation to the neighborhood meeting, which he hosts and the state makes clear in the notice, but it also includes the planning commission hearing date and time, and it includes the board of aldermen uh, meeting uh, dates and times as well. And the hearing is only advertised as the first reading night. So in the case of, of Logan Villas, for example, that first reading night is going to be uh, the 6th of April. Gotcha. And that's what went out on the notice for the residents to attend. Which, by the way, is actually the 13th because the 6th is an election night. <laughs> Anybody else? Greg Walter. Thank you. Uh, Chris, on the two meeting notice, this is a concern as far as from my point of view. People that are out there in the public and, uh, and they have something coming into their neighborhood, they're not as well versed as you or I or anybody else on this board um, as to what their alternatives are if they are opposed or if it's a contentious type of uh, application. So do we make any steps to show them that if you want to make an, to stop this, because obviously we're showing the developer how you have to go about developing and what, you, what rules you have to follow. Do we do this with the public? If anybody comes forward and say, hey, what can we do? Do we have any apparatus set up for that? If the public comes forward to ask for options, we give them that. Uh, the first step in any application is to encourage the uh, public to meet with the applicant at the neighborhood meeting. Staff is not present, so there's no pressure there with the city looming over the, over the proceedings. But it's an opportunity for the developer to meet one-on-one -on -one with all the, all the residents nearby and attempt to address their concerns. And that's why we request the sign-in list and the synopsis of, of what was discussed. But there's no there's no discussion with the people that live around the development. If they if they come to see me about it, as far as contact staff or uh, come in to visit, we go over their options. The ordinance does contain options if they want to challenge, for example, okay. uh, property owner, the certain percentage of property owners within 105 feet. If it reaches right. a certain threshold, then they can trigger a super okay. In as much as we're making this available, all this information available to the applicant, we're telling them, okay, here's your dateline that you have to do this by, and we're not giving any type of information to the people that live in the area because Raytown is not Lee Summit. Lee Summit has lots of green space. Raytown has none. So almost anything that you have in that's going to be a large development, and these questions that need to go back to Jennifer after this, um, is there, there's potential for them being contentious. And because of that, I think that we should adopt the policy whereby we also let the, if, if, even if it's in the letter going out from the applicant, if there are any questions, directing them to your office as to contact, who to contact within City Hall if you have any questions or that you don't want to, you don't want to stir up a, a fight, but you want them to know who to go to because quite honestly, most people don't know your office exists. You know. uh, Alderman Walters, that is included in the letter. There, there it mm -hmm. is a paragraph directing them to contact us if they have any questions. Okay, is that all it says? Is that they haven't? If you have any questions, Regar right regarding the hearing, regarding the application is what. Well, once again, as far as the applicants is concerned, we're telling them these are the steps you must take to to be approved. And if someone is opposed to that, we're not showing them the steps that must be taken if you don't want it approved. I don't think that's equal. Um, if, well, it, typically, um, Alderman Watchers, I mean, if you look at this flow chart, which is, this is another idea of giving that, giving the applicant, our, and also giving the public opportunity to figure out what steps are taken. This is why we did things like this and presented to you as a board and a public hearing. Uh, but if you look at this, you got three opportunities as a public before you even reach the board meeting uh, to, provide, to provide and get made aware of the project itself. Uh, you got the, the part here with the neighborhood meeting. Uh, then you also have the, the uh, 
the application is submitted, made, made, made whole in the uh, in the lobby, and then you have the public commission, the planning commission public hearing, and then you have two board meetings uh, uh, to to review it. So when you say that, are we letting the person know? Uh, that is provided. That's part of us putting information in the letter to contact us in order to do it. Typical the applicants, typical yeah. applicants are not even as aware uh, of the process either. So you try to make that make this process available to both and make sure that citizens understand that the zoning that we put in place and the, and the plans that we put in place years before that they all uh, have the capability of being involved in helps with, with demeaning with, with directing us as staff and others of what steps to take and what type of businesses will be in those positions. Okay, the, the application is, is we help with the applicant and in the letter the applicant puts out, it tells us if you have any questions to direct them to this, to Chris. If there, these, there will be two planning and zoning commission meetings. One. Uh, one. Okay. Do we, one neighborhood do we, meeting. Do we, do we have any confirmation? Meeting. Do we have any confirmation that these letters actually go out? This was the, this was debated last summer when the discussion on increasing the or the changing it to a, a certified letter format. Um, we give the list to the property owner. We ask them or the, the applicant. We ask them to give us a signed uh, form back that states that everyone that was on that list was provided a copy of the letter. And so they sign that and date it and give it back to us and goes in the file. Okay, it, this is this is all applicant based, because I, I know of, of situations where there have been where people will tell you, and I could bring them to your office and they could tell you to your face that no, we never did receive the letter from him. We never had a meeting with him because I didn't know about him. Yeah. This is a it's a concern because there are people who who are worldly and know how to get around the, the rules and stuff like that. And the next thing to know. You may have a retail outlet in the middle of a residential neighborhood that people just simply do not want there for many reasons, lighting problems and stuff like that. I really think we need to make this something that protects the citizens, the citizenry, particularly in a town like Raytown that is completely developed because people have sunk a lot into their homes. They want to protect their neighborhoods. We should be advantage of it. I can tell you of an instance, of an instance that I had over here in my own neighborhood where a developer came, I beg your pardon. Go ahead, Mr. Walters, and then Ms. Emerson's waiting. So you got about two minutes. Thank you. Okay, of, of, of a, a large change in the neighborhood, which put in a, a, a group home that we did not find out, except by my, cons, my, my questioning the owner of the property. And when I was told by the owner of the property, that this gentleman wanted to move here from a lake community to Raytown because he wanted to come to the Raytown School District, something just didn't click right. And when we did some digging, we found out what he was really bringing in here. He wasn't just moving his family here. He was moving many people from other, other families here to be taken care of. My point is there are people out there who will, who will play the system. And I think we need to be aware of that. That's why we need to have some sort of verification that people actually did receive these letters that go out and that they actually do say what we want them to say. Otherwise, you end up with situations, and I can give you other examples. There's one up on 63rd Street. It's not a funny thing, Michael. People do not like that thing there. There have been armed robberies there. The lights are on all the night, all night day and night. It runs 24 hours, and they don't like it. And that's, that's what's been done. Like it, they still get notified, so don't make No, it sir, they did not. Okay. And I can introduce right. you to Thank them. Thank you, Mr. Walters. You're done. Lie. Ms. Emerson, hey. go ahead. Uh, yes, there is a sign posted for quite oh. a few days, I think, what, 15 days ahead of time on the property that is being, uh, ha it's being questioned. And anybody that drives by there, whether they're in 185 feet or further, if they have a problem, they can contact the city and Chris will certainly take care of any questions or concerns that they have. That's all I have to say. Derek Ward. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. And, and this question is really more to move, move your mic just a little bit up close to your mouth. Thank you. There you Let's go. See. We'll try and get it out. Is that better? There you go. All right. Uh, for Mr. Gilbert or, or Mr. Hodges, I guess a question I would have, and I think this might go some of the way to uh, uh, 
resolving Mr. Walter's concerns, uh, is there any mention of who their aldermen are in those letters? Uh, you know, I mean, just name and contact number and uh, because maybe if maybe that would be another resource for people to know that, well, you know, they've got city staff, but if they feel more comfortable talking to their elected official, that's somebody else they could reach out to. Uh, there is not, but it, it's certainly an easy item to add to the, okay. to the bottom of the letter. Yeah, I'm just asking the question I'm, I'm, I, for feedback and discussion. That, that, that's that's it. I think it would be a good idea, but good. Yeah, it's good. Yep, good thanks. point. Good point. Mr. That, that's all, Mr. Mayor. Good point, Mr. Ward. Anybody Mr. else? Mr. Mayor. Anybody else before I? Mr. Mayor. Just a minute, Mr. Walters. I'm just checking to see if anybody else wants to speak. You've already spoken. Anybody else? All right, seeing nobody, Mr. Walters, go ahead. Yes, in the incident which I spoke of in my own neighborhood, there were no signs posted on the property. That I can swear to and I can get other people to back me up on it. It's Are not you talking problem. about the store? No, sir. Oh, okay. Well, yeah, I'm talking about others only thing. This, okay. this, my, my point on this is we can put the alderman's name in the letter. But if the letter doesn't really get sent, it doesn't really make any difference. We ought to do a way that verifies that the people that live in the community have as much information going to them as does the applicant. That's all I'm asking for. And to be able to verify it. If you do anything at City Hall, I guarantee you, you are verifying it. <clears throat> I'm sure that Chris does. I'm sure that he can show you every document that's been signed and every document that's been passed back and forth. And he can give you a date and time on it. Okay. The people that are in the community, point. they are not. Your point's well taken. Mr. Thank Ward, you. you have, go ahead. Well, I, and, and so following on to that, Mr. Gilbert or Mr. Hodges, do we have the people that are applying for these things to sign any sort of affidavit saying they've, they've mailed these? Yes. I, I mean, that's an affidavit. I mean, they have to. Oh, not an affidavit. I have them signed the actual mailing list stating that uh, they mailed everything out that was on there to all the prop dealers listed. I wonder if it would just, if it would make sense to maybe have them do an affidavit that's notarized and everything. So at least if they've lied, you know, where there's a possible perjury issue there. So uh, it wouldn't guarantee anything, but you know, that might help address Mr. Walter's concerns. Mr. And that's like, like uh, we mentioned earlier, this was something that was discussed quite a bit last year, uh, which that 185 feet came about, uh, which was a change and other changes that came about within that ordinance. If that's a uh, request, of the board to change the ordinance and bring that back up for discussion. Uh, you know, that's up to you all as far as uh, those changes, but to change that portion and require that certification, that would need to be a change to that ordinance. Well, I, I'll uh, look for your guidance on that, Mr. Hodges. I mean, I, I'm just asking the question. I would say that for that standpoint, um, I've been on both sides of it, been in the development side and been on the other side. Uh, for the most part, people try to do what's what they know they need to do in order to try to fight. I mean, as a developer, uh, when you're trying to do something now, the, the situations that Alderman Walters uh, brought before us, uh, I'm not, I can't speak to those. I wasn't here with those and I know exactly when those happened or what the whole situation was. Uh, but I, I can say that what we've been doing thus far is, is working with the developers, ensuring and, and, and reiterating our desire that our citizens are aware of the project beforehand, so they may have opportunity to voice their opinions regarding those. And uh, and Chris has gotten quite a few opinions beforehand that helps uh, before we ever get to to your uh, stage of approval uh, with the project itself. Uh, you know, because you have to think about it as well. Uh, when a developer invests uh, in a business within your city, uh, they also want to invest something that the customers can 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 utilize or actually be uh, a part of. And so with that, if they come with something that no one else wants to be a part of, it doesn't really help their investment either. So um, we, we you know there's several things you want to look at before you move down those roads uh, regarding uh, CUPs, regarding uh, public uh, uh, projects. So. Miss Mary Jane Van Buster. Hope you're, you're muted, ma'am. Nope, still muted. There you go. 
I think it's time that we put some of this responsibility on the citizens. A lot of people see these signs and they think, oh yeah, big deal, and they just drive on by. They don't stop to read them. A lot of them, when they get the mail, they don't even read their mail. They just see it's something from the city and throw it in the junk, throw it in the trash. That's not my fault, that's on them. And I think we need to quit spoon feeding these people, let them take some responsibility and <clears throat> let's move on. That's all I got. All righty, Ms. Baird. I, I just wanted to add though too, just to get, keep in mind that sometimes if property is already zoned for the particular use, you, you won't see an application come forward because it's a use that's already allowed. So I, Alderman oh. Walters, you kind of brought up something about the group home in a residential area. It may have already been allowed, which is why you didn't see anything, but I'm not trying to get into what happened in the past. Allowed. It was not allowed. I can assure you of that. In fact, Mr. Walters, do me a favor, please. Would yes, you sir. make sure you're recognized before you start speaking like everybody else? Mr. Mayor, okay. thank you. In the cases that I gave, one was a commercial development. The other one was a, a, a home for, for certain types of folks. And they, in both cases, in the one in, the, the one in this neighborhood here, the city spent about $60,000 fighting it. So it's not that, um, that these things aren't being caught up on like my end or the people. And as far as Mary Jane's comments, the letter would not come from the city. The letter would come from a developer they do not know. I don't know if I would pick that up and open it myself, to be honest with you. I think that we ought to just have some kind of, some kind of ways that we can make certain that people are aware of what's happening, what's coming to their neighborhood. That's all. And I don't think it's outrageous to ask that. Okay, thank you. Anybody else? Anybody else, all right. They don't open it, it's on them. Ms. Baird, do you have anything else to give us? Uh, no, sir. Ms. I do have a question. Chris Gilbert, do you have anything else to give us? Nope. We have time. Mr. Walters, you got two minutes. Thank you. I just have a question for Ms. Baird. Ms. Baird. Ms. Baird, under uh, our current, you were talking about uh, the Planning and Zoning Commission's job in development areas and so forth. Uh, under our current way of operation, it does require a board of alderman approval. Mm -hmm. That's what I thought. I just wanted to make certain. Yes, it does. Yes, it does. Okay. Thank All you. Right. Is there a motion for adjournment? So moved. Ms. Mary Jane. Second. Second. Sec Oops. Who was that? Give it to Janet. Oh, there you go. Ms. Janet, Thank you me. got that one. Okay. Thanks. All right. We'll do this by affirmation. All in favor say aye. 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 Anyone against? All right. See you guys at seven o'clock.